All right, so NVIDIA just released a version of Portal with RTX on, and it looks beautiful. Kind of makes you want to be able to hold a Portal gun in real life. So I decided to make it a reality. This is my Portal gun, and it was built completely from scratch. Through the power of 3D printing, some electronics, and some guides I found online, I was able to bring this iconic device to life. In fact, there's a few new features I made to improve upon the original designs. This is by far the most difficult thing I've made yet. So let me show you how it all went down. For last Halloween, I wanted to have an Aperture Lab costume, complete with a portal gun. So all I needed was to buy the portal gun replica released by, oh, they're all out of stock. That's okay, I'm sure they have a couple on eBay. And that was the pain I felt when I wanted to plan this costume earlier last year. And while I have a full-time job that pays the bills, I don't make that kind of money. So I decided I was going to build one myself. I needed it to be able to light up, switch colors, and play all the iconic sounds. Thankfully, there are some people online that already made some 3D printed portal guns using some Arduino parts. Working with and programming electronic boards isn't exactly my forte, but I was willing to give it a shot. I will link both of these in the description, but huge shout outs to Everett for the initial design and assembly guide, and to Lunchbox7985 for creating a guide for all of the electronics. My entire make, and the improvements, will be completely based off of the incredible effort that these two put into making this project possible. Now, back when I started planning all of this out, I thought, if I was building one, might as well build two, right? Cost-benefit analysis. And after spending over $80 in filament and 150 hours of printing, I ended up only making one. Look, I was an ambitious boy in 2021, what can I say? But a few weeks later, even though everything's printed out, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. See, both the front and the back parts of these shells were both printed in two separate parts. That meant that first, you had to glue the pieces together. Then we get to the part that you have to repeat again and again. Rub in some wood filler with a dab of water, sand everything down, apply spray paint. Then rub in wood filler with water, sand everything down, apply spray paint. Rub in wood filler with water, sand everything down, break the sander and burn yourself. Hot, hot, ow! Oh my god. Apply white spray paint. And look at that. Everything is smooth, hides the seam, and is finally a monotone white. I even finish it off with a few coats of super glossy finisher. Now, I didn't bother doing any extra post-processing on the black parts because it looked fine already. And at the time, I didn't know that you could get rid of plastic scuff marks from sanding just by using a little bit of heat from a heat gun. Now we get to the assembly. And honestly, Everett did a pretty good job of describing how everything fits together. Now, as good as all this looks, it doesn't provide any lights or sounds. And this is where Lunchbox steps in with the revised models and instructions on how to assemble the electronics. Also, I highly recommend printing the stand. It's perfect for when you're ready to display it. Anyways, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty about how the electronics worked and how everything's specifically wired up because that would be really, really boring. What is the hardest part about making videos about technology? Explaining it. Making them interesting and not boring. Your okay. Video. The only thing I want to warn you about is make sure that you pre-measure your wires so that you don't end up with an entirely tangled mess when everything's soldered together. But I will give you a simple overview of how it all works. This is the main board, an Arduino Nano. This is in charge of controlling all of the lights. That includes the three LEDs at the front, the ring of LEDs you put in the nozzle, the three changing colored LEDs for the middle tube and at the top, it interfaces with most of the controls in the back, and sends messages to the other main board the sound effect board. This board is like a conductor in that it tells the speakers which sounds to produce. And although this board can deliver sound directly to the speakers, its signal is about as weak as an AT&T customer going up north for the weekend. So we're gonna also need to connect this amplifier to get things bumping. So that's the basics of what the two tutorials guide you through. However, there's quite a few areas where I deviated or even improved upon the original design. First, there is a shortcut I need to address. The instructions recommend using this bubbly acrylic rod in the center. I thought it was a bit pricey, it was more expensive at the time, so I designed and printed out my own tube using clear PETG. The rod would have looked better though, don't cheap out on this part. But there are six other ways where I would say that I actually improved upon the original designs. 
Number six deals with how the back shell stays in place. In order to access any of the electronics, you need to unscrew this little back panel. However, this big old shell in the back prevents you from doing the unscrewing, meaning that this top shell cannot be a permanent fixture. So I decided to use some Velcro tape I bought off Amazon, so this top part could be secured into place and taken off when necessary. Yeah, look at that, works like a charm. Yeah, uh oh, that's not good. This meant that if I also wanted to use these black wires, they would also have to be detachable as well. In the original design, there were these little telescope looking things that you're supposed to attach your cords to, but these ended up breaking quicker than the new Pokemon games. So instead, I used my new best friend, magnetism. I took some old AV cables from an Xbox 360 for the cords, and they were the perfect thickness for these rare earth magnets I attached to each end. Now the entire back is fully modular. Number five has to deal with the front nozzle. In Everett's instructions, it has you putting a full logo in front of the LED ring, but I thought that would probably block out all the light. So instead, I printed out a clear layer of PETG to diffuse the light, and I think it makes for a pretty effective end result. But thankfully, someone recently redesigned this piece to have some light holes in it, so go print out that one instead. For number four, this has less with me improving the design and more so me making the existing design fit better. There were a lot of times where the entry holes just weren't big enough for connecting this collector piece into this generator piece. I had to use this tool to basically carve and peel this opening like a Thanksgiving potato. I recommend printing out some prototype parts so you can play around with the design sizes before, you know, spending 50 hours on a print. Speaking of things not fitting, these LEDs need way more space than what the entry holes allow. So if you don't want to modify the files yourself, be ready to drill. Number three on this list goes to the fact that the instructions list the Arduino Nano, but I instead use a knockoff Arduino Micro, which is considerably cheaper and still gets the job done. However, you'll need to look up the pinouts of both the Arduino Nano and the Micro, change the Arduino code to reflect this, but if you're careful, you should be fine. Now, this next one is pretty minor and is a personal choice. On the back of the portal gun, if you press this button, it actually starts to play the credit song, Still Alive. Now, if you've been on the internet as long as me, you might be a tad tired of the fandom's obsession with this song. On Reddit, if somebody makes the comment, this was a triumph, without fail, the rest of the comments will continue the song. It's like a cult, man. It's, it's, like, it's seriously like a cult. So when I take this thing out into public, I don't exactly want a bunch of nerds like me doing their own version of Christmas Carol. So instead, I put in the more up-tempo version from the radio that plays at the very beginning of the game. No lyrics, problem solved. And for my number one improvement, we're gonna have to fast forward a full year. Okay, now it's the end of 2022. I have three days to prep for a con I was invited to at the Wisconsin Dells, and the portal gun has not worked in over a year. It's just been staring at me this whole time. So it was time to pull everything apart and try to fix it. Unfortunately, I left myself in a situation where everything is connected pretty permanently. So any changes I make to the main board is not going to be easy peasy lemon squeezy. It's going to be difficult difficult lemon difficult. Okay, so to start things off, I found some disconnected wires that needed resoldering, which was no easy feat because I could barely see what I was doing, but that was the least of my worries. So I decided to sleep on it until day two. Thankfully, before work in the morning, I came to the realization that it was a power issue. See, the main Arduino board and the audio board run off two separate USB ports. If either of the devices aren't drawing enough power, the battery bank will stop supplying power to that USB port until you unplug it and plug it back in. So when the audio board isn't pulling enough power for whatever reason, it will try to pull phantom force power from the board which will make you believe that electronics can in fact express pain. What the hell? This is after I turned it off. Turns out that this is actually pretty standard power bank functionality. So I needed a solution and fast. Thankfully, I ended up finding one. This special always on power bank. 
This one costs just a little over 40, but I'm gonna need to fork over $85 for this model because it's the only one that will arrive on time. Goodbye, money. Okay, it's day three. Let's plug this thing in and hope for the best. It actually magically worked. It powers on and off. It even makes the iconic sounds. And of course, it plays that catchy tune with just the touch of a button. Let's hope that nothing implodes at the con. We got this. Okay, so, I just got back from the con. I'm pretty exhausted, but how'd it go? Success! Okay, but in all honesty, it was a really fun time. A lot of people wanted pictures. It was sometimes hard to get through crowds of people when you get stopped every two seconds, but it was a lot of fun meeting new people. Uh, some of the highlights included getting pictures with Chell, uh, the TF2 team, Monkey, and I didn't get killed by Homelander from the boys, so. You know, that's a positive. I'm kind of glad I upgraded to the more expensive battery bank because it actually lasted the whole weekend without me having to unscrew it and power it on and off, so that was a plus. And one of the only real issues I ran into is one of the arms on the front kind of started to break off. It was still attached, but I probably need to print off and replace some new ones for that. But I think that one of my favorite things at the con was uh, all of the elevators had no music. So I got to supply my own. Thanks for watching. Attention viewer, if you wish to avoid being subjected to further testing, I suggest subscribing to Big Recreates now or suffer the consequences. The choice is yours.